welcome to the Medical Menemist podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. On today's show, we have Jake Gittleson, co-host of the Learning Geeks podcast and global learning strategist for a large consulting company. Jake, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Chase? Not too bad. Pretty good. Let's see. We have a lot of, <laughs> a lot of interesting things to talk about. But first, before we get into it, I just have to compliment you guys on the choice of music. <laughs> the Seagulls <laughs> song for the intro is just... Uh, the first time I heard that, I was kind of stuck on the show. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for those that for those that are listening and the, the learning geeks, you can just do a search for whatever podcast that uh, podcast app that you like. But we use the Seagulls, which is from Bad Lip Reading. And um, for those that don't know Bad Lip Reading, they just you know they're on YouTube. Check them out. They're they're really focused on really looking at lip reading and putting a different spin on it. And they did they have done some great things with Star Wars. And we are just uh, us on the learning geeks are pretty much Star Wars nerds. At least two of us. And uh, we're just like, this is an appropriate song for, for us. And I, I saw your tattoo. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I mean, Geeks Unite. <laughs> yep. So you are the global learning strategist. And can you explain sort of what you do and, and why you guys started the Learning Geeks podcast? Yeah. So as a learning strategist for any larger company or corporate company that, that does have some type of learning approach or learning organization in their company. So in my role, I focus more on thinking ahead and thinking about what can we do to help our people learn better and what can we do to help them actually learn and gain the skills that they need to to be better with the role that they play as well as improve our organization, right? So it's, it's very much looking forward, figuring out what types of strategies and approaches can we take to make us a better learning organization. So there's a lot of research that's involved. Sometimes there's a lot of innovation that's involved of us thinking differently. What can we try out? And sometimes those thinking differently, those strategies are sometimes even older approaches, approaches that they've done for years, but we have just the technology as well as now the science in order to prove that it's the right thing to do. It's taking all that into account. It's getting outside perspectives and then sharing it with our learning organization and the people within it, how to go about implementing those strategies and thinking differently about helping individuals learn. So when it came to the, the learning geeks, it really came with three of my colleagues and three people I know just really, really well. And we just have a passion for learning. And we thought, you know what, we should do a podcast. We love podcasts. We were starting to get back into them. I mean, me, for me personally, I used to be huge into podcasts and I kind of went away and now I'm getting back. And I think that's kind of the actual curve now. I think that's really the, the trend. And we thought, you know what, let's just, let's just do it. We're, we are kind of geeky. We like to, I mean, you can, probably can't see, I know you guys can't see in the audio, but in my background, I have a Porg, like from, from Star Wars, from um, The Last Jedi. And I, you know, it, we, that's just what we did. So we're like, let's just bring our personality to the show and talk about learning and share it to people that are either in the learning profession, they're a teacher, they're in the K through 12 higher education space, or a learner themselves. They just want to know how to learn. And that's kind of our, our niche. Great. I know that uh, the audience right now might be wondering, well, this sounds kind of like a corporate learning. How is this going to sort of flow into my academic learning? But I really think that bridging these two is important. There are some different strategies for each, but a lot of similar strategies as well. So maybe you could go into a little bit more about your thoughts and philosophies on how we learn and how to use durable learning, which I know you've covered in a past Learning Geeks episode, mm -hmm. and how that can be used from a student's point of view. Yeah, I mean, I, first of all, just the, the, the two separations, I try to not think of it as two separations other than, again, the approach that which you would ta probably take as a learner or as an instructor, whoever, even though sometimes instructors are very much the same too. We as humans all have a, you know, the more and more we learn of how our brains actually operate and how we learn, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're a, a kid or a K through 12 or up to higher ed, we all have very similar patterns and, and strategies for ourselves and how to learn. So I try to really blur those lines and just think, how can we ourselves be better learners? So yes, I work in the corporate space, but I always say this too, we spend so much time thinking about K through 12 and higher ed, but when you think of ages, right? When we actually think of how old we are at the time. And again, sometimes people come in older or whatever. So 
but let's just say a traditional track is usually start at five, five years old, right? When you're in kindergarten, at least in the US, and then you go up all the way up until 22, 23 ish. But then what about like the remaining 55 years or 60 years or 65 years of our life? You know, that's, that's a lot of learning to do. And that's why I get so happy about and proud about being where I am because I can influence and think about how do we continue learning beyond because it really just doesn't stop, right? Okay, so that's a, a very good point, especially in some of the higher education uh, realms and the academic fields. They really try to focus on lifelong learning and we don't focus on how we're supposed to learn at later points in time. If you don't develop some of these skills earlier on, it can be very difficult to implement them later. You don't necessarily know what to do. You're not being taught how to do them. But one in particular was the, the durable learning that I found sort of interesting from the past episode and would like to cover in a little more detail. Sure. Yeah. So durable learning is not a, a coin term that you know, we came up with. It's actually been out there for a while. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just learning that lasts and learning that sticks. That was our goal. So so anybody, this actually applies to anybody. So you as a, a student or, you know, especially in the medical space, right? It doesn't matter. It's how can you yourself be a better learner? So there's various principles that at least we talk about, but I, I mean, I kind of wanted to just share some things of which, you know, within your role and your specific, where you're at in your education space or educational level right now is what you can do, right? So for me personally, when I think of durable learning and I think of me as trying to be a durable learning learner myself or a smart learner. That's what I like to think of it. Someone that knows how to learn, but like wants to get better at it. You know, the first thing I do or recommend is really to just take a step back and think of what you're really, really trying to learn. And I think this is a critical is that you're focusing on your learning goals. So in the context of higher education, you know, this, this applies too. So, and it requires more effort on yourself. And I think that's the difference mainly because you may be required to learn a particular subject especially in a class you're enrolled into. And when you're not the seeker or discoverer of something you're looking for answers for, you know, maybe you are, but, but let's say you're just not, that's when it's harder because it's going to require more energy. And our brains are wired to spend only the energy it needs to. So when we're trying to learn something, we're told to learn, getting the motivation is going to be difficult. Which brings me to my second tip, which is to discover personal relevancy. And this is a term that I don't even know if it's a real term or whatever, but I, it's something I came up with, meaning that in anything you do, find meaning for yourself. So find a piece of that, something that you're working on, especially if it was already prescribed for you, that makes you curious. Dig deep to find a connection to another subject or a topic area. And if that doesn't work, think of, a, think of it like a high level purpose. So let's say your, your passion is to be a medical professional. How would this topic subject improve my skills to do that? It's super high level, but again, it's, it's coming back to some type of root, like a root of challenge or goal that you're, you're, you're trying to accomplish. And that again, will hopefully connect to personal relevancy, which then makes you more engaged, makes you more willing to spend that mental energy into what you're learning. So I guess just when I step back and think about what does it mean to be a durable learner? is first start off by seeking personal relevancy. Once you have that, you feel good, write goals for this. And that's what's key to be a self-directed learner, which is a learner who takes initiative, owns and strategizes why, when, and how to learn. And I think goal setting will allow you to drive for something, make that plan, and constantly reflect on the status of it. So you know, there's so much more tips you can give with, and break down durable learning. But I just think if I'm going to focus specifically on how can I personally be a, a durable learner, a better self-directed learner, these are all very similar terms. It's really, those first two are so critical. And I, I think something I personally try to practice and apply in everything that I do. Awesome. I, I definitely want to talk about self-directed learning more too. Although one thing you brought up there, I find it difficult in the current academic realm, especially with the lecture-based education system, that it's hard to find what is personal and interesting when you're, you're forced to focus on what the lecturer is saying and in the way that they're approaching the material and in the way that they want to describe it. And it's hard to get that individualized aspect. Do you have any thoughts about maybe how to do that or, or strategies for after lectures, what to do, especially when you're limited on time after sitting in eight hours of lectures. But mm -hmm. 
just curious on your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, with, with that, I mean, that's a, it's a perfect scenario and it's hard because one of the first things that they're prescribing learning, or at least trying to come up with what approach or a path that they think is best. And sometimes it's very difficult for the individual to make sense of that for one, and also to connect to personal relevancy. So I think with self-directed learning, one key aspect of it is that there's, there's really two components. One is to have a strong support environment in place. So let's think outside of yourself. And then at the same time, you need to be a strong learner at the same time. So you're going to come in situations all the time throughout your life where you're going to be in those same situations, especially in the corporate environment or you know, even in the medical space, you're going to be constantly told you need to keep learning and keep going and further your education and further your knowledge in certain areas. But you're going to have to constantly come back to why am I doing this? And if they're telling me this, take some of it and then maybe find something that's really curious to you and, and then move on beyond that. It's going to take more than just the lecture format, right? And I think it is stepping beyond. I think that's probably the best tip. Okay. So to sort of get a better grasp for the students of how to format a self-directed learning schedule or, or implement it in their study strategy. What are some of the things they can do, how to break it down into more manageable tasks? Breaking it down, I think the best learners, regardless, even if you're really skilled at proper learning techniques, and many of you that are in this profession or that are in medical school, well, you probably have gotten here and you have been really good at learning. But I think there's probably ways that we can improve on and always constantly be smarter. And again, I think the best learners, regardless of where you're at, still need a strong support structure in place, especially at the start. And I've read multiple studies that says a person that has strong self-regulation, which is another term for self-direction, is that they need more support up front when learning something new. So to get better, understand what it takes yourself as an individual and what it's going to take to support, have that support environment around you. So let's start with more of the individual, right? So you as an individual, what can you do? I mentioned the importance of discovering personal relevancy and determining your learning goals. But additional things you can do is constantly scan of what makes you curious. And this will help you make more connections to prior knowledge, further building your representation on a subject or skill or task, right? So again, to that, I, I think is always look around what's around you. The lecture is just one component, just one component. You also have reading and yes, you may have assigned reading, but there's other readings that you can do out there. There's other things you can watch, talk with other peers, right? There's other things around you. Take it all in. And so I think constantly scan to what makes you curious. The another thing is push yourself beyond your comfort zone. So never get comfortable. And I think in a lecture format, again, it might be very passive, but what can make you push yourself beyond that? How can I take components within that lecture and maybe apply it in some way, apply it in some context? Or could I have a conversation with somebody, even if it's just, I barely know the subject, but can I push myself to, to learn more about it by sharing it, right? And another one, and is really, really critical, especially in the higher ed, is to space it out. And that is to avoid cramming, especially avoid cramming the, and jamming all this in the days before the test. Think of a test as a practice opportunity. And I didn't do this when I was in uh, college either. And I wish I did. I didn't think of it this way. And that is, whether it's a written test or an application test, I try to understand when I get a test myself now is that I understand that failure isn't always given high remarks in, in higher ed, right? I understand that. But, and I'm also not assuming that in the case in the medical field too, right? But tests should be meant to make you better, not make you anxious. It's really a milestone in the learning process and is just one component in your overall learning journey to accomplish that learning goal you define. And that's really what you're there for, right? You're, learning, you're trying to accomplish that learning goal as long as you define that. And think of tests as just one obstacle, right? Or one, not even an obstacle, because that's even a negative approach to it, but more of a, a method in which you can test your, your current thinking. I was just thinking of the stress mindset that I, I've read a lot about more recently and approaching stressful situations in one of two things, either stress being detrimental, in which case most people, most subjects, participants perform very poorly, or thinking as stress as an opportunity to overcome an obstacle. So just having that positive mindset generally seems to lead to better overall results. Right. And, and stress is good when you're learning, right? You want to have a fine line between too much stress and, and just the right amount of stress. 
because too much stress, it's very, very powerfully emotional. In any situation when it's powerfully emotional, you're going to remember that. So if you remember a negative side of a stressful situation, you're just going to remember the negative side rather than the actual learning that takes place, maybe from the more balanced stress. So you want effort, you want that. But again, I think that that's just extremely important. It's very emotional. And I know that uh, spacing is something that's really, really repeated by everyone in the learning sciences and learning psychology realms. Space repetition in particular uh, with retrieval practice, which is, I think almost every guest so far has mentioned that to some degree or another and using like uh, Anki flashcards as one of the more popular free softwares for it. So definitely, definitely agree that spacing it out and sort of putting these tasks into your study schedule ahead of time is going to make your learning a lot easier. I think that it goes into planning out your entire learning curriculum for yourself, which is a very self-directed process when done properly. There are definitely a lot of sort of ecosystem-based influences and distractions, whether it be in the class or even at home, or whether you have more lectures that you have to sit in versus watching pre-recorded lectures at your own speed at home. How do you overcome some of the learning ecosystem type of issues? I think that's a world that we live in, which is even harder, I think, for us just trying to be a learner. And we have information all over the place now. And whether or not it's, it's, you know, you look at your phone, you have information scrolling, you can scroll through tons and tons of information. You have your family members, your friends, all different types, right? There's so much different things around. But taking it back. And this is where I think the strong, having a strong support environment is so critical. And, you know, I mentioned some tips about being an individual. And if you could do a lot of those tips about setting goals and stepping back and figuring out exactly what are we trying to learn, hopefully you can clear out through the mess. But again, there's so much of the mess that I think it's so critical to have a strong support environment. And then I think one of the benefits of being a student in higher ed is that you probably have a peer group. You probably have a community of other students or teachers you can tap into. And social connections is so important when we're learning. And I think, I think about this, right? So when we read a chapter in one of your, like, let's say one of your books, I can sit and take notes, read them again, and hope for the best on the test. But what if I pushed myself after each chapter or subject and told my friends about it? And, you know, for me personally, most things I read are here. I go and explain it to my wife. You know, she has really, doesn't really care what I say, but it doesn't matter because what I'm doing is that I'm sharing it and I'm trying to get my thoughts out there. And even if it's not refined yet, I'm just testing it. So I'm using my network around me to help me further strengthen my knowledge on a particular topic. So, and frankly, that's, that's practicing, right? And when you're interacting with other people, their viewer perspective is probably different too. So again, that's totally okay. okay. And maybe they're testing out their view on it as well. But I think those interactions help you refine your understanding, makes you curious, leads you down, hopefully maybe even a a completely different path. And all you want to do is feed that curiosity and further build on your mental representation of a subject. And I think this whole concept, it's so important to just use that network that's around you so you can make sense of the mess. And again, Don't just bottle it up within your mind. You need to get it out. You need to use that approach and strategy as a, it is a strategy in which you can strengthen your learning. And I think just, uh, as you said, speaking about the topic to someone, whether they care about it or not, or even your pet, some uh, people recommend that is a form of retrieval practice. You have to pull out all the information, consolidate it, synthesize it in a way that makes sense to you, that's individual to you, and then speak it to something, even if it's a pet, a plant, a wall, <laughs> it's still a form of retrieval practice that can be very useful. Right. And I, I think the, one of the other tips is be best buds with a teacher. It could be one, it could be multiple. Someone that knows the subject, get them outside of their lecture format or maybe their formal format. And a great book for those that are listening is, I totally recommend this book called Peak. It's by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. And chapter three, I think it's chapter three, talks about mental representations, which are essentially a visual depiction of concepts or ideas we have on a particular subject, task, or skill. So a medical teacher has a very mature mental representation of a specific topic or various things, right? And they're probably super complex. 
but they can help you, especially be best buds outside of their normal context. They can help you build your own mental representations that are accurate. And I think in one of the, their chapters, they said, get a teacher, you know, which of course going to Star Wars makes me always think of Kylo Ren and the Force Awakens yelling at Ray, like get a teacher. <laughs> um, but, uh, but what they mean by this is that if you stay within a bubble of people that you have a particular view or complete a task or a particular way that is not accurate, your mental representation of that will be inaccurate. So a teacher, one you know is an expert on something, learn from them. Maybe even be, you know, be friends with a few. Maybe even you can combine a few and make yours even more unique and something that may even be better, frankly, right? I think that is just so important. Use that network and help other people. Think of them as a support structure so you can make sense of the world, especially with all that information around you. And then at the same time, pass it on. Because by passing it on and by sharing it, not only are you helping them, but you're also helping yourself because you're refining your thoughts and you're building that mental representation of that uh, particular topic or idea. No, I love it. And I love that book too. I read it earlier this year and it's definitely one of my favorites in the education realm right now. Lots of useful information. <laughs> yeah, tons, tons of information. It's one of those books that you could read and I actually read twice. The first time I was in a state where I came off multiple books that were in very similar topics and I didn't get it. I think I was just tired of reading the same things. And then when I came back to it, I had a whole totally different view on it. And I appreciate it way more. And I got to actually talk with Robert Poole. I talked with him for a while, the co-author of it. Yeah, I did hear that interview. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's really cool. All right. Well, since we're getting close to the end here, I have one last section for you. Walk down memory lane. Would you like to take a walk with me? (laughs) Sure. Sure. All right. Is there anything that you wish you could remember better? Uh, Probably guitar. Uh, I mean, I know it's, I I used to play guitar, but I was really good at just playing chords and I never really stepped beyond that. But I, you know, I sold my guitar not too long ago and now I kind of wish I didn't because I, I think I can pick it up even better. So that's one area I I do wish, because I see my brother do it and makes me a little jealous and I kind of want (laughs) to play with him. Uh, I'm the same way. Uh, chord progression, one thing. Never really got the scales down well enough to, to be very good. <laughs> All right. Looking back, is there anything that you wish you could change about how you approached your training? I would have put more effort into it. I was, especially when I think of before, within the last couple of years, I kind of, I learned to the test. And I wasn't trying, I wasn't purposely trying new techniques. I wasn't trying to put more effort into it. I wasn't trying to make myself comfortable. I stuck with the familiar and I wasn't really reflecting on what I was doing. So now I'm making that effort to do that. And I I wish I did that more. I bet a lot of the audience can relate. I know I sure do. (laughs) Is there anything that you wish you did different in your career or side gig so far? I wish I gave myself more time for white space. I used to just put in the hours after hours after hours thinking that that was going to be the way for me to get better at what I do. And I think I learned five times more now than I did a few years ago by just changing my approach. So I give myself white space. I reflect a lot. I try to get new perspectives before I move on. I so then I can re- constantly refine my thoughts. And I, I just swear by those techniques. And I know they're proven by research and studies, but doing it myself, I know. I know how it feels. I know the reward I'm getting. I want to constantly feed and get more of that reward. And also, I'll never say I can't learn something. Much like I used to believe about learning a language. I'm like, well, I'm not a person that can learn another language. I'm just not to do it. The reality was I just didn't have the energy to do it. Because it wasn't the time. I have the time, but most often not. It's because we don't have the actual energy to put into it. Because now in my heart, in my heart now, I know if I spent the energy and effort, I can learn. I can learn that language. I can learn really anything. And that to me is the mindset is that by putting the energy into it, by putting in deliberate practice, which also comes from peak, by putting that practice and effort and constantly aware of what you're learning and assessing it, monitoring it, I believe that you can, can learn faster and more efficiently. Wow. And five times faster, according to your 
Yeah, I, that, that was just a random number I made up. But like, <laughs> that would be pretty impressive. I, I think anyone in the audience would love to learn five times faster. I just, I just feel like within the last couple of years, I, as I've switched to more of a, a learning science focus and really making an effort for me to be a, a more durable learner, or a smart learner, I have just seen a change. I've, I've grown the confidence in what if something, if you brought me something, I, I think I can learn it. I have to agree. I kind of have done the same thing recently, especially the past year. And I did not do any of that during medical school. So <laughs> I learned it afterwards and not as helpful. Are there uh, any resources that you'd recommend for the audience? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of books out there and, you know, Chase, you may have mentioned this on your podcast before too, but one is A Mind for Numbers and that's by Barbara Oakley. And she's you know, she's famous for the How We Learn course on Coursera, mm -hmm. but I started off with the book. And so when I did her, when I did her course, it was very similar. You know, so if you're, if you're into the Coursera, do the Coursera, but I like the mind for numbers. It talks about being math and science, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's all about how can you be a better learner yourself? We already mentioned the book Peak by Anders Ericsson and Robert Poole. Another book that's, I still love to this day because it's a book I can use as a reference and that's Brain Rules. And that's by John Medina. He is a uh, neuroscientist and he just has a great way of breaking it down to a, using language that you're not a neuroscientist and you can truly understand it and give some tips. And then the last one is uh, look up Barry Zimmerman. He is a uh, well-known professor on self-regulation. So if you just do a search within your journals or your, your journal database, you can find a ton of information on some of those techniques what I, we talked about. And basic techniques on how to be a, a smart learner. Great. Yeah, we just had Barbara Oakley on, which if everything is in order, she should be the episode before this one. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what's going to happen, but <laughs> current plan. But I, I'm not too familiar with the last two, so I'll have to check those out. Yeah. Any parting thoughts and uh, where the audience can find you and your community? Sure. So parting thoughts, I would say, is to just be a learning opportunist have an open mind to all the things that are around you. Take advantage of those items, those experiences, those opportunities. And like I said before, think of a test as a practice opportunity. Think of a discussion with a peer as an opportunity to articulate your thoughts or gain new perspectives. Spend a few extra minutes with a professor to build upon your mental representation of a skill or, or topic. And to me, that's being a learning opportunist. Take advantage of the various opportunities, the things you're hearing, the things you're reading, the people you're talking with. Take advantage of that and help you refine your thoughts and, and those mental representations. And, uh, you know, again, learning is a process. It requires support and it requires effort. And, you know, as you move beyond medical school, me especially knows since I, I support this space, learning will never stop once you leave, leave the formal education. So seek out those opportunities and always push yourself so you feel uncomfortable and are never settled uh, with the normal. All right. And then uh, your community apparently has changed a little bit in recent times. So do you want to give an update on, on where people can find you and the Learning Geeks? And Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I forget you asked that. Sorry. <laughs> and then, uh, so the best way to find me is probably either LinkedIn. That's always a good place to find me. So if you want to talk there, or you can go to learninggeekspod.com. That's our, I mean, when you go to the website, it's a basic site that just gives you the information of what we are and then also some links to your, you know, Spotify and Apple Podcasts and so forth. But you can also search on any podcast app and search The Learning Geeks. And we try to release on an every two week basis. Um, we're kind of in a, a longer one right now just because of travel schedules, but we're always uh, trying to discuss learning and try to focus on the discussion, not just on for learning professionals, but also for, for learners, teachers themselves. Awesome. Well, Jake Gittleson, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I hope the audience checks out your materials and the Learning Geeks podcast. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. There's been a lot of useful information and we can add all this to the show notes as well. It's been my pleasure, Chase. All right. Take care. All right. You too. We'll see you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you, so please send an email or join us on the Medical Anemonist Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated.